By the way, Tom Brady is basically out of problems. Uh, that is the only problem. When he solves that, he'll have no issues. Sure. You know, whenever we have legal apparel questions, we always bring in Laura Ingram. Laura. Uh, Laura's going to be joining us very shortly, and I'm just curious, what sort of uh, what? hard time with the person, Laura, what, what sort of hard time would the person who stole uh, Tom Brady's jersey be <laughs> facing? <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess it depends if they've moved the jersey across state lines. <laughs> oh, that's the <laughs> problem. We could have mail fraud. We could involve wire fraud. There could be a, a conspiracy, maybe a RICO violation here. So there's uh, there's there's potential for punitive damages on yeah. the civil side. So this is, I think Brady's going to get that shirt hey, back. What do you think? <laughs> jersey I gate. So. I hope so. Someone went in his bag and actually deliberately took it, he says. All right, yeah. let's talk about what's happening today in the courts, because the executive order is going to be heard by these three judges in the Ninth Circuit. What do you think will happen? Will they um, rule in the president's favor or will they send it to the Supreme Court? Well, it's an interesting makeup. We have one Obama judge, we have one um, Clinton judge, and we have one George W. Bush judge. So uh, one judge sits in Hawaii. The case will be heard in San Francisco. Uh, and remember, the case is not a case on the merits of whether the ban is constitutional. The case only involves the stay that was put into effect, the emergency stay that was granted by the uh, lower court, the district court last week. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the appellate court has to look at two things. Well, a couple of things, but two things are the most important. What is the likelihood of success on the merits? for the petitioners. Is it likely that this ban will be overturned uh, as unconstitutional or contrary to statutory uh, interpretation? Uh, and number two, uh, the other point is, is there irreparable harm uh, that will be done to either Minnesota, to Minnesota and uh, I believe uh, Washington State right. is the other state. So Minnesota and Washington State are the litigants. Now, I think those two hurdles are very difficult to clear, both the likelihood of success on the merits, given what we know about Section 1182, giving mm -hmm. the president broad authority, uh, and the irreparable harm that is, is, is very difficult to remedy. Irreparable harm to Minnesota and to, uh, to Washington State, I don't think either of those two standards are met. You could also argue, guys, I know it's getting a little legalese here, you could also argue that the states themselves do not have standing to bring this case sure. as states against uh, the Trump administration. So hey. those are the three things that were, they were briefed in the Justice Department's brief. They'll be argued. But I have a, I have a feeling they're probably not going to get relief from the Ninth Circuit. This will go to the Supreme Court, and Lord knows right. what will happen there. But, Laura, yeah. let's take a scenario where the Ninth District Court uh, says, no, the, the stay, we can't do it, and goes to the Supreme Court, is 4-4, goes, so it goes back to what the Ninth says. Having said that, it doesn't stop the administration from putting together their extreme vetting program and criteria and right. putting it in place in those seven countries. It just stops the pause, correct? Correct. And so uh, I was talking to a couple of my former uh, Supreme Court clerk colleagues last night on the phone, and we were thinking maybe this is a time for repeal and replace <laughs> of, the, of, the, of the immigration yeah. pause. Uh, maybe you, you, you redo that and, and, and maybe make it a little bit more specific. Sure. The president, president should come out, I think, and make the case for why this is in the nation's interest. He didn't do that. I, and I think a lot more people would be open to this idea. You might even get a few Democrats on your side. If the president goes to the nation and say, this is why this is important. Exactly. Uh, we welcome immigrants. Most, exactly. Of course, most Muslims around the world are, are welcome here. Uh, we welcome people from all over, the, uh, all over the globe. But this is about you and your safety. And let's get this right before right. we move forward. I think that would be a great way. That would make the case moot. In other words, the case would lose all, mm -hmm. uh, all standing because there really would be no case anymore. So that's something uh, I, would, I would think about if I were advising the president legally on this. Sure. And, of course, uh, people shouldn't be surprised. President Trump promised during the campaign he was going to crack down on immigration. He also talked, and, and you know this well because you were uh, following this as well, uh, Kate Steinle was uh, killed by an illegal who wound up with a gun in his hand. He had been deported five times. He was still extraordinarily in this country. Bill O'Reilly asked the president about it during that same interview that we saw about 10 minutes of it on, there's the guy who uh, killed Kate Steinle, Kate Steinle on, right? Uh, we saw a lot of the interview at the Super Bowl. Here's some more on what's the deal with uh, these illegals and the Democrats. Listen to this. Why do the Democrats oppose oppose at protecting Americans from violent foreign criminals because Why? they think that's their voter 
they think that's their voter. No, potential I, voter. Yeah, I, you know, you go into the Twitter sphere, and there's a lot of that stuff out there. Do you think that's accurate? I think he's he's largely right about that. Uh, we know from a, a what a groundbreaking study on naturalized citizens voting was done back in 2012 by James Gimple. He's a professor at University of Maryland, and he examined the voting patterns of uh, naturalized foreign-born immigrants in the United States. Looked at places like Broward County, Florida, Clark County, Nevada, uh, and and other counties across the United States where large uh, new voting blocks overwhelmingly represented the Democrat Party. So mm -hmm. state uh, San Bernardino County, Florida, I mean, I, was, I, I lived there for a summer back in 1984. That was a Republican uh, stronghold. There was, now there's only like 33% of Republicans. Mm -hmm. Back in 1980, it was 55% of Republicans. So there's no doubt about it that immigration has had a lot of benefits to the country, but it's really changed the, uh, the electoral makeup in favor of the Democrats. They know that, and there are other reasons they like uh, a, a lot of illegal immigrants uh, with, uh, getting amnesty, mm -hmm. but they know that that's a new treasure trove right. of voters for them, and they're, they're going to bank on that. That's, that's why they were trying to push through immigration amnesty. Mm -hmm. well, uh, in the state of California, they're now talking about making, instead of sanctuary cities, making the whole state a sanctuary state. <laughs> and one of the leaders, the leader of the Senate, is that right? Yeah, the Senate Democrat, Democrat leader. He, listen to what he said about his family members. I can tell you half of my family would be eligible for deportation under the executive order because if they got a false social security card, <coughs> if they got a false identification, if they got a false driver's license prior to us passing AB60, if they got a false green card, and anyone who has family members, you know, who are undocumented knows that almost entirely everybody has secured some sort of false identification. That's what you need to survive, to work. They are eligible for massive deportation. Wow. So, so not only... Is this his is family, a, half his family in the country illegally, they've got fake driver's licenses and social security numbers, <laughs> and he's the Senate leader for the state yeah. of California. You know what that's called in court, guys? That's called a statement against interest. That would be admissible <laughs> in, in an immigration court against his family his whole members. Family. This, guy's, this guy's just not very smart, and I have a question for him. What, what documents can American citizens fake Fraudulent documents can they use to board an airplane, uh, to get other federal benefits, to vote. and expect not to be prosecuted? Yeah. The, the, the idea that, uh, that illegal immigrants should be able to use false paperwork and, and then everyone should just say, oh, isn't this wonderful? Isn't it great because they just needed to work? Well, yeah, there are a lot of people who need to work in Nigeria, in, in California, in Connecticut, my home state, who don't have, have jobs. So should all of them be able to just, okay, we're going to use false paperwork to either come into the country or to travel around the country or to mm -hmm. get a government job. That is the kind of uh, hubris right. that I think people are so tired of. There are a lot of people hurting out there. I know there are a lot of immigrants who want to come here, and, and we'll have an orderly process of doing that. That. But the idea that we should give our legal imprimatur to people who routinely falsify documents puts our national security at risk, our economic standing at risk, and the entire right. rule of law at risk. That is preposterous. All right, Laura. Thanks so much. It's, it's uh, crazy. And he's caught on tape. Uh, and that yeah. was allowed. So let's yeah, see what happens exactly. to that. But that just yeah. shows you how impervious he feels to saying things like that because he doesn't think there's going to be any follow-through. There probably isn't. There probably right. won't be. You're right. Uh, Laura Ingram, thanks so much. Mm-hmm.